I'm Colleen. Um, me and my husband Scott have uh, we have three children that we adopted out of foster care just last December. Um, we have a 12 year old. She's the youngest of six, and uh, she's been with us for four years this June. And we have two boys. They're siblings, and um, they've lived with us. It'll be three years at the end of August. Uh, so we've um. We've done a lot with this curriculum to help ensure the stability of, of our kids. Michaela, who would probably, that's the, the girl, she would probably still have her, even without this curriculum, although it would have been more challenging. The boys, we certainly would have. Um, the youngest has uh, some bad behavior. Um, and if we didn't have this trauma lens to look through to see where the behavior is coming from, um, it, would, it would be really hard to manage. Uh, he identifies himself as the protector. So when danger arises, he dives in and he runs towards it to partly to have control over when his beating occurs um, and partly to divert any danger away from his older brother. So um, the three choices when you're in um, when you're confronted are fight. Thank you. Fight, flight, or or um, Freeze. He really only has one available option, and that's to fight. So um, all sorts of difficulties come from that in school and at home. Um, but looking at that as a strength, I mean, he's, he's trying to protect people. That's pretty amazing. Um, you, have, you end up having a different response, and, and you're able to respond to his behavior versus just react to being attacked. So. Um, most of my examples will probably be about him because they're the most visual. The other two children, they have a bigger repertoire from the fight, fight freeze. Um, so, and, and they have more subtle behaviors. So his are very visceral and very present. So that's, that's why the, the curriculum is so important to us. And um, my husband would have wanted to be here today. He's actually on the flyer, but um, the kids are in crisis. <coughs> Uh, my name is Ron Tarkowski. Uh, my wife Amy and I uh, have a four-year-old uh, foster daughter who we've had for just about two years now. Be two years in April. Uh, we took the she took the training first uh, and came back and went, "Oh my goodness, all these things that we're seeing, it's because of this, that, this, and that." And said, "You have to take the training. You have to take the training." And so I finally was able to get in on the training, and it does, it connects a lot of dots. It's amazing when you learn some of the the strategies. Uh, from this training to be able to kind of look through a, a, a child's eyes and try to view it from their point of view. It's amazing how what seems like a, a just that bizarre behavior all of a sudden becomes very, very normal. Uh, and it's it's a spectacular it's a spectacular training and it's it's we wouldn't have her either, I don't think, if we hadn't taken this training. I'm Rebecca, and we have three kids, uh, plus two we adopted from foster care, and we currently have two foster placements. Uh, the two kids that we adopted from foster care came to live with us in 2003, and that was way before there was any uh, talk about trauma-focused uh, anything. Uh, my daughter was seven, she was, her diagno incoming diagnosis was a childhood schizophrenia, bipolar, PTSD, I mean, it, she had every alphabet available. And the more therapy we did, the less any of that made any sense. So when we discovered uh, the trauma-informed therapy and that curriculum, it was like the clouds went away from the sun. All the crazy, crazy things made sense. And actually, it turned out to be really very brilliant coping strategies for her. Uh, when she was three or four, but not so much when she was 10. Uh, so that, uh, just seeing the transformation in my child uh, has really made me feel strongly about this and I want everyone else to be out there and get it too. Uh, we, we sort of, uh, the, the kids that normally come to live with us are the really naughty boys who've already uh, uh, been released from other foster homes. <laughs> So 
by the time they get to us, they usually uh, they've usually got some pretty good baggage. And it's it's been miraculous to see what the trauma curriculum can do for them. I'm Shannon Reagan Shaw. I'm a foster and adoptive parent with Dane County Human Services. I have two children, Randy and Tiffany, that we adopted out of foster care. And just like Colleen, uh, we would not have been able to do that without the tools that we were able to learn from going through this curriculum. Because thinking about trauma and an individual approach with your kids give you a way to look at the challenging behaviors that they have that they have and help them heal and learn from them in a productive way that doesn't stress you out. And that's very different than if you're constantly reacting, reacting, reacting to the behaviors. <coughs> so in addition to the two kids that we have adopted out of foster care, we've probably fostered 20 other children over the last five years and have a teen mom and her baby staying with us right now in addition to our kids. Um, my husband and I have both been through the trauma-informed parenting curriculum and we've helped facilitate it a number of times for other foster parents. Um, we're also involved with the NCTSN, the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. You can see a lot of the slides for what we're talking about today. This information about trauma, about how it affects kids, about how trauma affects kids informs their behaviors and then what you can do about it. A lot of this information is the same kind of training that is available to foster parents who come to classes like this. And what we do with this information is we talk about the effect that trauma has on the child, how different kinds of trauma affect children differently. And then we talk about how once you know that information, what can you do with it? Why is it useful? And when we're teaching this to other foster parents, then somebody will present the information and then other foster parents who are familiar with it will help facilitate the discussion. They'll talk about personal examples for how they've used this information to be effective with their kids, how it's made them look at the behaviors differently, and what they've been able to do about it once you start thinking about where these behaviors are coming from. So we're gonna to try to create, recreate a piece of that for you today. We don't have time in this lecture to go through even a quarter of the material that we would normally go through with foster parents. But we're gonna give you some of the background and then hopefully with a lot of examples as we go through it today, we'll talk to you about how foster parents are able to use this information to make a difference. So as all of you in the room, or pretty much all of you are social workers, you can think about a way to interact with the foster parents that you're gonna be dealing with when you're out in your careers and how you can use some of these ideas as a different way to think about a child's experience and how they might have their own special needs based on how they perceived the events that were happening and how it's affecting them today. With that, we'll get started. We have a lot to talk about. So why are we talking about trauma in the first place? Many kids that are in foster care have lived through traumatic experiences. The very nature of foster care means that these children have been separated from their families, which is a challenging thing in and of itself. And lots of the kids that come into the system are coming in on CHIPS or delinquency petitions. If you're coming in on a CHIPS petition, these are kids that have been through physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, neglect, sometimes multiple or all of those things. Those experiences are gonna shape the children that they are and how they look at the world. These kids, when they're removed from those families, when they're removed from those experiences into a foster home after we've been through extensive licensing, extensive background checks, places that you as social workers are fairly confident they're gonna be safe, loved, well taken care of, they're still gonna bring those experiences, those traumas with them. And trauma, those experiences that they have, the trauma that they experience is gonna affect their behavior, it's gonna affect their feelings, their relationships with their birth family, with foster parents, with their peers, with you as the social worker, and their view of the world in profound ways. Because it affects all of those things, it's not possible to be effective with a child and just look at their behavior. You have to look at it in the context. And that's why this way of thinking and parenting, looking at things from a trauma lens, becomes so important and why it's made a profound difference in how all of us have interacted with our kids. 
So the idea is when you understand what trauma is and how it's affected your child, it gives you tools to think about how you can communicate with them effectively in a way that they can understand and that can be healing. How to improve your child's behavior and attitudes, which let's just be honest, as parents, that's going to be a huge goal for us. You can try to communicate with them all you want, but if you can't get them out the door and onto school, you're going to have fights every morning and you're going to have a lot of feelings like I am not doing my job, I am not getting them where they're supposed to be, when they're supposed to be there. So there has to be an element of practicality. If you want a training to be useful and effective for people, then it has to be actually useful and help them with the difficult and challenging situations that they're going to be encountering. Looking at things from a trauma lens will help your kids to get the help that they need because you'll be understanding where they're coming from in a way that helps inform you as a caregiver what services might be necessary or helpful for you. Where does your job as the parent end and you need somebody else who's an expert in a different kind of area, like mental health professionals in particular I'm referring to, to get them the help that they need. Importantly for foster parents, looking at things from a trauma lens will help you in terms of compassion fatigue or secondary traumatization. We are working with kids that have really challenging behaviors. Working with them 24-7 when they're exhibiting all these challenging behaviors can be exhausting. It can be frustrating. If they're doing the same thing and you are loving them as much as you can over and over and over again, it can be really hard to feel like you are doing your job as a parent if you are not able to be effective with them and nurture that relationship. So you, what you find as social workers is that you have lots of foster parents who get burned out, who feel like failures, who feel like they don't have the tools that they need to handle these kids, so they boot them out of their home and they'll take somebody else and try over again. Which, as you know, when you start moving a child from home to home to home, in addition to the trauma that affected them for why they got into foster care in the first place, <coughs> you're just adding insult to injury because with every move that that child has, they have more experiences they need to overcome. It becomes that much more challenging for them to establish any sort of meaningful relationships with other people. So if you as social workers can help give your foster parents tools to effectively handle their kids, communicate with them, establish relationships, feel like you're being successful in making progress, the stress level in the foster home is going to go down. Those kids, even kids with challenging behaviors, will be able to stay there and everybody will be able to benefit from it. And anytime you can feel more effective, you're going to have more job satisfaction. You as social workers will stop getting those crisis calls in the middle of the night. I can't handle this. My child ran away again. They've been going in a temper tantrum for six hours. This is so hard. What are you going to do the next morning when you come into the office? How can you help that foster parent? If you as social workers don't have tools to understand where these behaviors are coming from, and that foster parents don't have tools to understand where these behaviors are coming from, let alone what can you do about them to help, we are all in this field to help these children, then nobody is going to feel like they're doing their job well and people are going to get burned out. They'll quit on the kids, they'll quit on the job. For us, going through this material and understanding trauma, how it affects the kids and how we can be effective has been transformative in our experience with taking care of children and feeling like we can do it well. There was a time that um I would have stepped aside because I felt like I wasn't doing any good to the kids. Um, but then I realized there's nobody standing in line. You know, if I step out, there's nobody there. So I gotta get better at this. And then when what you're doing is not working, more of the same is also not going to work. So you need other tools in your toolbox, and this is a variety of tools. <coughs> So there are some ideas about kids in foster care and thinking about trauma that we have to be really careful to just get out of the way before we even start this conversation. My love should be enough to erase the effects of everything bad that happened before. 
you will probably encounter foster parents, especially new foster parents, that think that love will overcome all. I have such a big heart. I love these kids so much. They come into my home, and I am just going to love them, and I'm going to make them feel better. But it's not enough especially if that child doesn't know how to love in any sort of healthy way because they've never had that experience before. <coughs> if you have a foster parent whose number one tool is love, why are you laughing, Rebecca? <laughs> <laughs> you better turn your phone off when you get home. <laughs> My child should be grateful and love me as much as I love her or him. <clears throat> You take them out of a place where a child is living in poverty, being deep every day, lucky to get one meal a day, and you put them into this home where they're going to be loved, they'll be bathed, they'll be fed, they have toys to play with, they have clean clothes, and you expect them to all of a sudden be grateful? Well, maybe, yeah, they like having something to eat, but they still want to go home. If you have foster parents that can't understand that, it's going to be really hard to get them to understand a perspective that will help them look through the world from a child's eyes to see what they need and why they need that. My child shouldn't love or feel loyal to an abusive parent. <clears throat> As foster parents, we have mixed feelings about this because we're the ones that are there when the kids come home from visits. We're the ones that have to prepare the kids to go to visits, and we're the ones that pick up the pieces when parents don't show up. If that same parent who's causing all of this drama and trials and tribulations for these children are also the ones that abuse them, you can better believe that we are going to have feelings about that, especially because you know we're here because we love these kids and we want to help. But the kids are going to love their parents, too. And you have to find a way to communicate with your foster parents in a way to help them understand that and to keep that in mind when they're dealing with all of these hard situations from visits. Looking at things through a trauma lens will help you to do that. It's better just to move on, forget, not talk about past painful experiences. I think in general in this field, people have understood that ignoring or denying the past is not going to be helpful or effective. But I think when you try to think about the past, especially when the past is painful because of severe abuse or neglect that happened to these kids, especially when the past is painful because they've had so many disruptive placements, it's really hard to know what to do with that information because it's not something that's fun to think about. So you might understand that this child has a past, and even though you think, well, I'm not going to deny it, I'm not going to pretend like it didn't exist, I'm not going to just ignore it, I have no idea what to do with that information. I don't know how it's going to help me do my job. I sure don't know how it's going to help the foster parents do their job because they're busy. They're trying to juggle kids, juggle schedules, juggle feelings, juggle all of these skills that they're trying to teach the kids to help them catch up a little bit. <coughs> so what am I supposed to do with this information? Looking at things through a trauma lens gives you a healthy, productive way to look at those past experiences and help them integrate into the child's feelings, thoughts, perceptions, and actions in a way that can be both helpful and productive. And you don't need to have a special degree or 17 years of therapy with the child to help them to do that. It's just a different way of looking at things. I think also, uh, just to interject really quickly, yeah. um, it's not something, these are missed to avoid, but they're unavoidable. Uh, I mean, every, every foster parent, I, I would bet, the rest of my life's income on is gonna feel, this kid should feel grateful. I mean, it happens to me, and you may get a call going, I can't take it anymore, even if they've been through the trauma parenting uh, classes. <laughs> and especially if you're familiar with the material as well, you can always remind them. I and mean, it's, my wife and I do it all the time. It seems we're blessed enough that when I kind of get fed up with some of the behaviors, she's not, and so she'll take over and tag team, and I can kind of take a break, and and recenter and go, okay, yes, I understand why this is happening. But it's a, it's a very important thing that even though it's a myth to avoid, it's unavoidable. It's going to happen. And just reminding parents of, of, you know, okay, you know, it's not this way. And well, you know, relating a past, you know, well, you know they're acting this way because of whatever is really going to be helpful for them. Because it even, you do this sometimes, and it's very difficult. And what you guys see as social workers is not, that even remotely 
close to the tip of the iceberg of what we deal with every day as parents. And that's something you, you, if you keep that in mind, you're going to be very, very beneficial to all your foster parents. I would jump in as well and say, uh, if you haven't been raised in a logical world, then logical parenting doesn't work. So the logical consequences are, are a mystery to, to kids. And if, I think one of the, the big struggles for us when we started was just to really understand how differently these kids were raised than we were. And one story that kind of always resonates for me is my husband was getting ready to go uh, spend a weekend with his dad and he was packing. And uh, our foster child who was six said, you know, where are you going? He said, well, I'm gonna going out with my dad for the weekend. And this little boy said, you know where he lives? Mm. So like, oh my gosh, you know, you know, we're just so used to being surrounded by family or, or at least, you know, no matter where they are. So it, it really is like kids from a different planet. So when we're talking about trauma, there's lots of different ways that that's word, that word is used, and there are actually different kinds of trauma. So if we're going to have a productive conversation this morning, we need to make sure that we're all on the same page about this. A traumatic experience is one that threatens the life or physical integrity of a child or someone important to that child, like a parent, a grandparent, or a sibling. So a stressful event where you skinned your knee is not necessarily going to threaten the life or physical integrity of you. So in and of itself, a skin knee would not be a traumatic experience, although it might be stressful to differentiate. A traumatic experience causes an overwhelming sense of terror, health, and horror. So there are big feelings that go along with this experience. As well as a, trauma, a traumatic experience produces effects inside your body. You will feel a physical reaction like a pounding heart, rapid breathing, trembling, dizziness, loss of bladder, or bowel control. And I want to make sure that everybody understands this, that a traumatic experience is something that has to have all three of these components to it. It has to be perceived in this way by the person experiencing the traumatic event in order to differentiate from something that's just stressful or hard. And even with that, there's different kinds of trauma. An acute trauma is a single event that lasts for a limited time. And a great way to think about an acute trauma is a car accident. Has anybody in the room ever been in a car accident before or a near miss? Did you have a feeling of terror when those cars were going to crash? Was it scary? Were you worried you or somebody important to you was going to be hurt? Did you feel the adrenaline going through your body? Your pulse is racing, you're a little short of breath, maybe your hands get a little bit sweaty. You have a reaction to that, right? <coughs> now, people that experience acute traumas can have lasting effects. Has anybody ever been in a car accident and not wanted to get back behind the wheel and drive to go to work the next morning? Was it hard? Yeah, absolutely. But how you perceive this event is going to be different. Imagine you're driving along, <coughs> going someplace you normally go, with your best friend sitting in the car next to you. And you get T-boned at an intersection, at East Wash. You're driving on East Washington, you're coming up across Stoughton Road, and you get T-boned in the middle of the intersection. Now for your friend, the moment that was really scary <coughs> might be the moment of impact because that car was coming right next to her and she was worried she was going to be hurt, right? But for you, the traumatic experience for that car accident could be the 20 seconds in between when the car hit and when the child strapped into the car seat behind you cried and you knew that they were okay. You were in the exact same intersection you are experiencing the exact same event, but the part that was scary for you was very different. Now, your friend might have a hard time getting into the car. She might have a hard time <coughs> driving, especially at that intersection. But for you, the part that was hard because you experienced that event differently might be the next time you're supposed to put your child in the car behind you. I can drive just fine. I can even drive on that intersection okay, although it might not be fun. But don't ask me to take my child and put them in a car seat and take them to daycare because that 
is too scary for me. I'm not sure I can keep them safe. The experience of the event might be different, and that's just a single car accident. Now imagine for a minute, what happens if you get into a car accident every month for a year? Will that affect you differently? How much more challenging would driving to work be if you got into a car accident every single month? Now some people might say, okay, I, I get this idea. An acute trauma is something that happens once. A chronic trauma is something that happens multiple times. But I'm going to experience this sensation. It's going to be scary. I'm going to have this biological response in my family. It's going to threaten my life or physical integrity of me or someone important to me. I understand that. So I kind of I figure out, I can think about it and understand how this makes sense, especially with physical abuse, right? if you're thinking about a child who's physically abused. But how does neglect fit into the picture? If you're thinking about a small child, an infant who's un or a toddler who's unable to care for themselves, then it's really easy to understand how neglect, not being fed, would threaten their life or physical integrity. But the waters get a little bit murky when you're thinking about neglect with older kids. Because it's going to be very different if a 10-year-old is neglected than if a 2-year-old is neglected, right? A 10-year-old will be at school, they have friends, they might have a school lunch program, they would have other tools and resources both within themselves and available to them because they are not 100% dependent on that caregiver, right? So neglect is one of those murky things. Neglect can be a very traumatic experience. It doesn't necessarily have to be. But if you think about it with older kids, those ki older kids that are neglected might be able to get food for themselves, but if nobody's ever around to take care of them, where are they likely to be spending their time? Out with their friends? If their parents aren't supervising their friends, are they going to make the best choices? Are they going to start experimenting with drugs, sex, alcohol, other things that in and of it, it, itself might, their parents not being there might not be a traumatic experience, but it opens the door for a whole other area. Did you have a question? Yeah, does the reason for the neglect matter? For example, if the neglect is because of drug abuse or the ne neglect is because that's kind of how they it all, the, the child it all depends on how the child perceives it. Okay. So it could, or you could have a child that's extremely resilient and self-sufficient because those are skills that were nurtured from them for a long time and it could be perceived very different. So like we were talking about, a traumatic experience is one that, that's very scary. It threatens your life or physical integrity. If you feel very resourceful and resilient, that's not going to be that scary for you. Right? But it could be. It's all perspective. Now, the term complex trauma is a term that's used to describe a specific kind of chronic trauma and its effect on children. There would be multiple traumatic events that begin in a very young age. And the thing that really differentiates complex <coughs> trauma from other kinds of trauma that people, children or adults could experience is that the very people who are supposed to be taking care of this child are the people causing the trauma to them. They're supposed to be protecting the child, but they're the ones causing the abuse. That adds a whole nother level of difficulty because then in addition to that physiological response where it's scary, it's threatening your life, the person who's supposed to keep you safe is the one that's doing it. We'll get into this a little bit more as we move on in our presentation this morning, but the reason it's so hard with the kids that are coming into foster care as opposed to the kids who are experiencing a car accident is this level and the interaction between the, the adults that were supposed to love them, nurture them, educate them, and keep them safe and their relationship to the traumatic experience. 
And that's why as foster parents, it gets so complicated for us to help them because then we are the ones in the position where we are supposed to love them, nurture them, take care of them, and keep them safe. But that's not their experience with caregivers. So how children respond to trauma varies. Children, long-term trauma, chronic trauma, uh, complex trauma, where the trauma is perpetuated by their caregiver, interferes with healthy development of a child. It affects a child's ability to trust other people, their sense of personal safety, their ability to navigate their own emotions, how they're supposed to feel and how they do feel. What is love if the person who's supposed to love me is the one that's hurting me? And their ability to navigate and adjust to life's changes. All of these things are going to be affected based on what kind of a traumatic experience they had, who was perpetuating the trauma, how old they were when it was happening, what sort of developmental tasks were they supposed to be undergoing at this time, how did the child perceive the trauma when it was happening, how many times did it happen. There are so many factors that can affect how this trauma affects their development that looking at their behaviors with the trauma lens, like we've been talking about, <coughs> helps you to dissect for each individual child the effect that their experiences had on them. And that's why we have found as foster parents it's so effective, because it gives us the tools and the resources we need to look at our parenting as a one-size-fits-one approach, rather than having this general understanding of hard things that happen to kids and how you can be helpful with them with the one-size-fits-all approach. Because the experience that they had, the traumatic events that they went through, how old they were, who it was that, it, that did it to them, what it was that they did, what kind of inner resources or resiliency or self-sufficiency did they have at that time, et cetera, are gonna affect how they view that trauma. That's gonna affect how we parent them and how we help them to heal. And if every child goes through these things differently, just like when we were talking about the car accident, my friend and I were in the exact same car accident, but the part that was scary for us, even though it was the same accident, was so different that in order for us to heal, we need a different approach. <coughs> That's why we found it's helpful because these, this idea of looking at kids and looking at our parenting style through a trauma lens gives us the tools that we need to use that one-size-fits-one one approach. And I just talked about this. So, how kids show that they're responding to trauma can be in a very, <laughs> very ways. Oftentimes based on the child's internal temperament. Oftentimes kids are hyper-aroused response to trauma, and that looks like nervousness, jumpiness, quickness to startle. They're very vigilant about their environment and what's going to happen. They're always on the lookout. There are kids that will be going through and thinking about their trauma, but how they show that they're reacting to their trauma is that they'll be re-experiencing it. They'll have intrusive images, sensations, dreams, memories of the traumatic event or events that have happened and it's like they're back in that place. <coughs> Kids can also avoid or withdraw when they're trying to do that. And sometimes that can be tricky as parents who have to play detective and figure out if this kid likes to be alone or if this behavior has something to do with the trauma. But avoidance and withdrawal often looks like a child who's feeling numb, shut down, separated from their normal life, pulling away from relationships, pulling away from activities, avoiding things that prompt those memories. And the biggest clue that you can use to figure out if the child that you're thinking about in particular is avoiding or withdrawing is that change. Maybe you have a child who was very gregarious and social and liked to play a sport and was very active with the family they experienced this event and now they've stopped. Their behavior is different compared to what it was before because now they don't talk to people, they don't want to go play, they don't want to leave the home, they don't want to do anything in the home, and it's that difference that's the clue with avoidance and withdrawal that that event, that experience changed something for them. We'll get into these more. 
trauma reminders are things, events, situations, places, sensations, even people that a child can connect with a child, a traumatic event. So with the car accident example that we used before, just so you have an idea in your mind that getting into a car and having to drive could be a reminder of that experience. Or for me, putting my child into a car seat could be a reminder of that experience. Those things could be reminders of it. All of these, geez, you can tell I'm not used to this system because I keep going too fast with that. The keys. The re experiencing, the withdrawal, the disassociation, the trauma reminders, all of these different reactions to trauma give you a place to start when you're thinking about how to effectively interact with these children who've had these hard experiences. As foster parents, this gives us a place to start. So, what we're going to do next is we'll talk a little bit about how trauma affects the child in particular, and we'll go through some of these ideas and talk about as parents. What, how we can use a trauma lens to figure out how to effectively parent them. And as social workers, you can be thinking about how to effectively counsel the parents that you're going to be working with to be effective resource parents for these kids. So we'll go through each of these in a lot more detail. Kids that are having traumatic stress reactions have all kinds of issues. Learning, taking in new information, in the home, in the school, any place they're trying to acquire new skills. Bedtimes are a huge problematic time because if every time you go to sleep you're thinking about something that's hard, who would want to go to sleep? If every time you fell asleep you were re-experiencing or imagining and dreaming about that car accident, trying to stay awake is a brilliant strategy to avoid those feelings. And you get emotional instability. Moody, sad, angry, aggressive kids, all very common labels that are put on foster kids. And how to differentiate between the times when they are feeling this way because they're reacting to a traumatic experience that they had versus something they don't like is something as foster parents, you have to get pretty good at being able to differentiate. And just as an aside, I want to stress to you that looking at behaviors from a trauma lens does not give these kids a free pass. Thinking about and understanding where these behaviors are coming from, where these feelings are coming from, does not give a child license to behave however they want. But if you want to change the behavior and help them to heal, the only way you're going to effectively do that is to figure out what's driving the behavior, and that's where you focus your interaction. If you're just reacting to the behavior and you're trying to use logical consequences, the child is not going to be healing, they're not going to be understanding where these behaviors are coming from, they're not going to be repacking their suitcase, all of these things we'll get into more, but you're not going to be able to affect the frequency or the duration or the severity of the behaviors that you are the problem to begin with. Looking at things through a trauma lens gives you a way to view the behaviors so you can help them heal and be effective, <coughs> not to give them a free pass. Traumatic play is something that we see with kids a lot. A lot people talk a lot about how kids in foster care um, are often acting a lot younger than their chronological age. Is that something you guys are all pretty familiar with? It's very <coughs> common. Children experience life, communicate with others, communicate with each other, and learn best through play. That's something that's just a common developmental task. That's how kids do it. So even if you're talking about older kids, when they're acting like much younger kids, the way they view the world and experience it is through play. So play is a huge way that you can play detective, figure out what their experience of the trauma was, because it's the experience that's relevant, not our facts that we can put down on paper for what an impartial observer saw, because different people can experience the same event very differently. But it often comes out in play. So what we see a lot when we're thinking about how we view traumatic play to get clues for what's informing the behavior is the kids will repeat or all or part of the traumatic event. They'll take on the role of abuser. They'll try to determine different outcomes. If I play it this way, will the same thing happen? If I play it this way, will the same thing happen? They'll get stuck in a particular moment or event. And that gives us big clues for how they're perceiving the traumatic experience and what part it is that they need to heal about in order to move on. 
the behaviors that they're exhibiting are often in response to how they're perceiving it. This is where we get a lot of our information to figure out how it is that they're looking at those behaviors just generally in our home. With older kids in particular, we get an idea of how they're perceiving the trauma um, through conversation. Language is a skill that develops fairly early. By age four, the majority of the neuronal pathways are set in terms of language development and skill acquisition for being able to say sentences for kids with healthy, normal development. That's hugely delayed with kids who have been through these, both because the experiences themselves affect the brain, which we'll talk about but also because the homes that they're coming from are often not the homes that provide a lot of the nurturing experiences that help kids acquire the acquisition of language. But when you're talking about older kids that either are trying to be done playing or experiencing more things and trying to communicate with people through language, then how we figure out what their perception of these traumatic experiences is is through conversation. When you're talking about the same kind of event all the time, bringing up conversations out of the blue. It's something that's on their mind. They keep reintroducing the subject, especially when they're confused or mistaken about details. The facts that the adults might know about the situation might be perceived very different from the kids. That's a huge clue to their experience of the time. And remembering only fragments of what happened is very common. So when kids are having experiences in one environment and then coming home to talk to us about it, it's very normal that they're not able to communicate about the whole event that happened, but just a part of it, because that's all they were able to integrate so far. It gives us an idea of places to start in terms of thinking about how they perceive the trauma, what their experience is in terms of older kids. And there's, out of the blue is, is a big one. There's nothing like uh, going to pick up your foster daughter at preschool and having a teacher pull you aside and go, well, we were at circuit time today, and we were reading Fuzzy the Duck, and your foster daughter said that um, she was locked in a cage at home. So you're gonna get, you will get calls from from foster parents, but yeah. So what do we do? Or just more, it, depending on where you are, just venting even, or or you know, well, we found this out about something that happened at home that you might not be aware of. So it out of the blue happens a lot. We get a lot of. You know, one minute we're talking about Disney princesses, and then the next minute it's some big bombshell that, oh my goodness, and it, that's a big, that's usually for us, with our experience, if it comes out of the blue, that's usually something that, that was a major event for our foster daughter, that really affected her. And that actually brings up a really good point, Ron, because as social workers, you probably have already uncovered the idea that the files you have in these kids are incomplete. They don't have all the information and the facts about all of the experiences that these kids have. And in addition to these kinds of conversation or playing being illuminating in terms of experiences that you might not even be aware of that happen to these kids, this is how we get a clue on how they perceive them. So when you're creating your files and your case reports for things that are happening with the kids, and you want to figure out a way to be effective talking with your foster parents, especially if we're thinking about change of placements or moves, or if you're going to be a social worker inside a school and you're thinking about kids who are transitioning from classroom to classroom, while your case reports the focus might be on including as many facts as you can. The part that's helpful for us, the part that we can do something about, are the perceptions about those facts. The facts in and of itself aren't real relevant if that's not the part that was scary for the child, if that's not the part they were having the physical reaction to. And no matter how careful you try to make the files, it's impossible to make them complete. Things will always come. We had a child who exploded every day in the cafeteria. I mean, pearl and trays, static kids with forks. Just, what, what's going on here? No. Well, it was at lunchtime that the social workers came and got him and removed him from home. So every time he walked into the cafeteria, he re-experienced the terror of being pulled out of school and, and shipped away. 
uh, we have two little girls, five and seven, come to live with us. Their paperwork says no exposure to sexual abuse, nothing ever happened. Within the first 24 hours, Barbie and Ken are doing lap dances. Uh, there's a lot of very graphic sex. Um, all the noises are right. So, gosh, that's kind of a clue. <laughs> there's a little more going on here than what our paperwork says. And not that I expect you guys to know it all. Me. Oh, but we do. <laughs> when you're going to bring a child to your house, we want you to be the expert and give us all the information because it just makes our job easier. But we know you don't. Yeah. So then, do you share this information if you're, you know, this child's coming from a different school district and coming into your home, do you share that with the school or do you release this information between the social worker and the school so that the school can be prepared for in order for us, uh, because of the confidentiality associated with kids that are in <coughs> their releases of information are really important. But when kids come into our home, there's usually a release immediately with us to be able to talk with school, with us to be able to talk with mental health professionals. If, that, if those are already in place, that's something that's set up, it should be within the first 24 hours. And if that's something we know, that lunchtime is a huge experience for them and how they experience the being pulled out of their family and put into foster care, and that in and of itself for this child was a traumatic experience, and lunchtime is a reminder of that traumatic experience, absolutely, we need that release so we can talk to school about that. Because we can't do anything, and school can't do anything to be helpful, effective, or healing about that if they don't know then all they're doing is focusing on a child who's throwing trays and trying to consequence them. Throwing trays isn't safe. That's not something we do in the school. But throwing trays is the symptom. It's not really the problem here. So if you consequence them for throwing a tray, they're just going to find another way to unleash this feeling because they, as children, don't understand where all this is coming from. And as foster parents, without that information, we wouldn't either. Yep? Is there something that the trauma come up with uh, of ways that social workers remove children from the home can mitigate that certain economic There are a lot of free, free <laughs> online resources that you can download, print, and disseminate as much as you are willing to do from NCTSN, available for social workers, foster parents, school professionals, mental health support staff, everybody. And they are constantly adding to it. It's a huge network with lots of free <laughs> resources, webinars, free webinars, free handouts that you can give out, the trauma resource toolkit, and then there's foster parents who are very familiar with the information and other people that would be happy to talk with you if you have questions about how to implement. Question over here. Everything it did when you saw the snake. 
even though there is no fan. Next time you go down the path, you see a stick. And it's just a stick. It might even have some leaves on it. It's a stick. But your brain screams, snake. And you feel the snake. All your snake noises, <coughs> your heart pounds. And so you are learning that the path is never safe. You never know what to expect. And those reactions, those, that feeling stays with you and shapes the way you look at all paths and it all sticks. So for my family, uh, Christmas is sort of a big deal. We have a lot of extended family. We have three or four Christmases. We have a couple kids with us that have had a rough life, so they would go through all these Christmases. And we're driving home for the last <coughs> one, and my husband and I are congratulating each other on how well everything went. Wow, this was went a lot smoother than I ever dreamed. And the nine-year-old girl says, yeah, nobody got drunk and the police never came. <laughs> so we're thinking they're just really having a great time when actually they're frozen in terror waiting for the next shoe to drop. So be aware of the stick or the snake and understand that that's how kids, if school was scary before, school's gonna be scary again. Just because I say, this is a safe house, no one will hurt you here. <coughs> if that's never been my experience, I'm just expecting you to. I'm expecting you to not feed me. I'm expecting you to put soap in my eyes when you give me a bath. But that's the child's reality. And having a trauma lens helps us look behind what used to just be naughty behaviors, crazy behaviors, or you know, whatever and see what's really going on so we can move forward and help the child move forward. And keep them in our house. So everybody's body has their own way of handling the stress response. When your body sees the snake, it releases chemicals to help the body respond to the threat. It goes right into light, fright, or freeze. Maybe some people would be angry and stop the snake. They would have that fight response. Maybe some people would go, ah, and run away. And maybe some people would just be frozen. I don't move. The snake will go across the path. And then I can, I can function again. But once the snake is gone, or once you realize that it wasn't actually a snake, even though it was in the same spot, and it's kind of twisty and a similar thing, but it's actually a stick, once the threat is gone, everything returns to normal. This is the way your body typically handles acute trauma. Something happens scary once, it responds to it, you get elevated, your body is releasing that adrenaline, you're having all these feelings, you're having a physiological response to that threat, but then when the threat is gone, when the car accident is over, your body goes back to normal. And as adults, we all have things that we maybe like to do to help our body go back to normal. Maybe we call a friend, maybe we take a vacation day, maybe we go read a book, maybe we get a hug, maybe we go get something to eat or something to drink. We have things that we do to help us cope with those hard things. But what happens if you see that snake and you have to walk on that same path every day and every single day you're on that path or every month you get in a car accident or every day you come home and you don't know if this is going to be one of those days with dad when he's going to sexually abuse you or you don't know if it's going to be one of those days with mom when she's going to start hitting you around. You don't know if it's going to be one of those days when you're going to be fed or if you're going to starve then those same chemicals that your body is releasing in response to threat, your internal alarm system goes up and it stays up. And for kids that are experiencing chronic trauma, in particular complex trauma, from the very person who's supposed to love them, the very place and people who are supposed to keep them safe, they, what they learn, what their brain learns, is to go up, be elevated, Stay alert and stay there. 
pulling them out of that environment into a place that you've checked because you've done the background checks, you've done the home inspections, you know that that's a safe person, you know that's a safe place, is not going to bring them back down. Their threat level is still going to be up high because that's what they learn. It's a lot safer for them to see a snake where there's a stick to keep themselves safe than to assume it's a stick and be bit by that snake. All of us have evolved this threat response systems to try to keep ourselves safe. It's a lot safer to see a threat where there is none than to miss the threat entirely. Right? Yes? No? Dick Hong was completely unable to learn his alphabet for the first year of kindergarten. But anyway, he was unable to learn his alphabet because he took it as his job to make sure all the kids around him was safe. Um, and it took us until mid-summer after kindergarten to realize that that's what he was doing. And then we got him into reading recovery where they take him out of the room into a very small room with one person. He was able to learn to read. So he got his alphabet and was able to learn to read. But as long as he was protecting everybody around him because that's his job, because there are snakes everywhere here, man. Um, just couldn't do it. So if we think about this as a learned behavior, and it grows the brain, then we need to know a little bit about brain development. And the easiest way for you to explain this to foster parents or kids is to use the risk model. All right, is anybody familiar with that? Brain development happens from the bottom up. In the bottom part of your brain are your primitive basic survival strategies. Flight, fright, or fear. <coughs> That's where you start. Right down here. As you go up the brain, you start getting more complex. You get rational thoughts, the ability to plan, abstract thinking. You can't start thinking or being rational if you are stuck down here in your primitive brain. So the brain also develops by forming connections, <coughs> that spider web effect across our brain. So if our kids learn over time that there are snakes everywhere, then the neuronal pathways to sense that threat are going to be really developed. And the pathways to develop rational thought won't. So interactions with caregivers to help kids feel safe so they're not stuck in flight, fright, or freeze. You have to feel safe to not be in that place. You can't be in a state of stress and threat to develop rational thought. Your interactions with caregivers to allow you to feel safe so you have the ability to develop logic are crucial to brain development because those neuronal pathways will not develop without that sense of safety. And the more a parent experience is repeated, the stronger the connections become. You will have a stress response in your body for acute traumas, for things that are hard or scary. That car accident will have an effect on you. But over time, if there isn't another car accident, and months and months and months and years pass, and you have a clean driving record, no car accidents, your body's response to getting in the car and how it remembers and perceives that experience will go away. If you get into a car accident every single week for a year, the more that experience is repeated, the stronger those connections become in your brain. <coughs> And the ability for you to rationally think when you get behind the wheel, if you've been in 52 car accidents in a year, that you will be able to get from point A to point B safely will be gone. But your brain never stops making connections. Ever. Even as adults. Even as older adults, if that's a PC thing to say. <laughs> so if you start trying to learn something else, learn a new idea, 
while it might be harder because your brain is not actively growing like it is with kids, especially young kids in their first couple of years of life, it's always possible to learn new things. But as anybody who's tried to learn a foreign language as an adult has probably experienced, the older you are, the more set those connections are inside your brain, the harder it is to learn something new. The more repetitions it makes to make those new connections. It's possible, it's just harder. So for us as foster parents, this was a ha kind of moment for us because what we learned is when our kids experience things the same way again and again and again with this complex trauma, with the people who are supposed to take care of them that aren't, that are actually hurting them, then their response to how they're interacting with us, if mom was the one abusing them, and I'm the one trying to take care of them, is actually a brilliant survival strategy. Avoiding me and trying to run away is really smart if they look at me as the mom who's going to hurt them. And it's going to take a long time for me to establish new neuronal connections inside their brain to give them the idea that moms can do something different. It's not personal. It's what they learn. That's a big, big <coughs> thing to instill on foster parents. I think that's probably the, the big thing, at least for my wife and I. It's really difficult sometimes to separate the behavior from what's causing the behavior. Oh my God, she doesn't want to get into the car. What? You know, what? And you know, she's doing it because she wants to make you late to work. And that's what's going through your head because she's being a pain and she didn't get X, and you know, you, you put all stuff together, but when you kind of, when you step back and realize, well, she doesn't want to get in the car because one of her earliest memories, possibly her first memory, is the police removing her from her mother's home and bringing her to our house for foster care. Well, of course that's traumatic. And it's not, she's not trying to, she's not trying to, to make my life more difficult. She's just re-experiencing this trauma every time she gets into a car because when she gets into a car she gets removed from uh, her parents and even after two years we we cope with it it's much better but she still has times where she doesn't want to get into a car and it's really difficult even though even though she knows you know it's it's been the same she's way she's thinking rationally she, she might understand something yes. different but her body is still feeling and it's it's really it's not about you is what you can tell the foster parent. It's not they're not try, intentionally trying to make foster parents' lives difficult, but it's just it's all. They occasionally know. they are. <laughs> yeah. not like they're true, occasionally true. they are. Yeah. But, but usually they're not. Yep. I love this about talking about wanting to pinpoint like the reason why you're doing things, and when you mentioned that you know, taking a really long time. Are there ways that you think would help? Yeah. Especially in a school, I've worked in a school before. You don't even have the time to, to dig deep like that and figure that out. I think it's, I, I think it, no. I, it's really just, it's, I think it's different for every single kid. Um, and it just, yeah. Getting, and, especially with files that are complete. Getting the child to engage in a way that will help you to understand what you need to know is a challenge. That's the part that's going to be different for every kid. Yeah. But if you can get a child to play school, whatever part of school is hard, it can give you clues if you can get them to do that because they feel safe and comfortable with you. So that will inform you what their perceptions are of the environment, the people around them, the experiences they've had them before, what's going on in their brain, especially if you allow them to take on different roles. Because as we were talking about when we were thinking about traumatic play, it's very common for kids to take on the role of somebody else. So if we play school with our kids to figure out what's happening in school that's bothering them, then I will play the child and they will play the teacher. They will play the principal, they will play something else. So you get an understanding of what their perception is that they say, how they say it, what comes next, what they remember. And if you can get them to play that with you, with younger kids in particular, who are still real focused on play, or older kids 
who might be chronologically older but developmentally and socially in their interactions much younger, that can give you huge clues to figure out what's going on. But you need that time invested up front to figure it out. With older kids, figuring out a medium to help them express themselves, sometimes through music, sometimes through art, sometimes through conversation if you're really lucky, but oftentimes those skills are not developed enough to do that, then it can give you clues as well. If they're not willing to engage with you because they don't feel safe, they don't know how to make connections with you or sometimes anybody, because their experience has taught them that it's just not worth it, anybody I get close to will hurt me, anybody I get close to will leave me, whatever their experience of the world is, then your job is that much more difficult. And it's that child that's really worth the investment and the time to figure out what it is. Because you could probably imagine where they'll be 20 years down the road if nobody <laughs> steps in to figure out what's going on with this child and what kind of help they need. So do you find yourself saying should it you give each child a time to with the special play? Exactly. And car time. And car time is car time. huge. Yeah. Car time. I'm going to run and get milk. Who wants to come along? One person. Unbelievable things come out at 60 miles an hour. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> so, yeah, and, it's, and you get very creative in figuring out how to start those conversations with that particular child. With, with my teenager, it's, so it seems like math was hard today. She can take that whichever direction she wants from it, which will be very different than the kinds of things and how I would start a conversation with my son, who He's going to need two action figures in his hand, and he's not going to tell me what's going on, but he'll act out with the action figures what happened in class. And all I need to do is listen and try to drive in a way that I can occasionally like use the little extra mirror, because I have the like regular rear view mirror, and I have the like child one underneath it, which is tilted right towards me. <laughs> so I glance up, and I try and look and see what the action figures are doing as he's explaining to me through that play what happened in his day. But I could never do that with Lisa. I find that I often don't get to the root cause, but if the consequences aren't working, if other things aren't working, you know, then definitely switch as, qu as quickly as you can to looking at it through something traumatic happened here, you know, and um, how can I respond in a different way that, that helps him manage the moment. And a lot of times just knowing that um, when he should have been developing impulse control and stress management, he was working on survival. So he doesn't have the pause between anger and response. So sometimes, I don't know, but guessing some sort of trauma is involved in them. And talking to them in a way that communicates with them verbally or non-verbally, whatever is appropriate for that individual child, it seems like what you were doing here before was brilliant. But we have to do something to help you learn that you don't need to do that anymore. How can we help you feel safe is a great way to start a conversation when you have no idea what's informing the behavior. Because if you start with the assumption that they were really smart for doing that in the first place, but hitting's really not okay, so we need to figure out a different way for you to handle this because you don't need to do that anymore. Their response to you and the interventions you're trying to do to help them heal, to help them learn appropriate social skills, to help them with challenging behaviors is going to be very different than if you're scolding. Hitting is not okay. We don't do that. Just did it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and it, it's, it varies. I mean, there's, it took us nine months to realize why our foster daughter would scream and baths, she would take a bath when it was hair, time to wash hair, not a good time. But scream, yell, don't get water in my eyes, don't get water in my eyes. You know, I'm sitting there squirting the, the thing in my eyes going, see, it's just water, it's not gonna hurt. Well, we, nine months later, car time, um, turns out, well, mom, when she was bad, mom used to put her in the bathtub and squirt dish soap in her eyes. Mm -hmm. So, of course, she associated that. That was a trauma reminder for her that bathtub, hair wash, you know, soap was near the near eye, and that was, it was huge for her, but it was huge for us, because then all of a sudden it went from, okay, she's just kind of, you know, our birth daughter was, took her a while to get over the, 
you know, water. And I said, no, oh, kids, but we're like, you know, this is excessive. But then all of a sudden it was like, oh, okay, as opposed to, oh, she's, she's just kind of, she's a little sissy. She wrong. All of a sudden it was, oh, okay, this makes a lot more sense. And so now, yeah, even better ideas. <laughs> um, but we were able, you know, it makes a lot of sense. We're able to deal with that and go, okay, you know, and, and come up with some strategies and talk about it while we're washing her hair. And so she feels more comfortable. It's still problematic, but it's, it's dropping. Well, and even if you don't know that mom put shampoo in her eyes or soap, uh, to me, you, you give the kid back their power. Every child you've ever had, little bit of terrified of baths or showers. So we have swim goggles that we keep in the bathtub. And you can just stick those on if you're worried about water or soap in your eyes. And it doesn't take very long for a kid to realize, well, I don't really need these anymore, or I don't, they just sort of get over it. But when you give them the control and say, you know, instead of saying, oh, don't be ridiculous, you're a I've never got soap in anyone's eyes. Just assume you're gonna, and give them something to protect themselves. It just shows that you get it, you understand them, and you're not gonna make them feel bad for being scared yeah. or for having a reaction. We deal a lot with kids regressing their house, and we're fortunate that two of our children cry because you can hear what age they sound, and then you parent them at that level. Oh, you're an infant right now, come here. You know, or, um, oh, wow, you're two, and that's a big fit. Okay, all right, what would I do with a two year old hiding within the grocery store? You know, it doesn't matter that they're 12, but that's where you parent them in this moment in time. It, it's like you get a new computer and you're told it's running Windows 7, and nothing is working. And it's actually, parts of it are actually running Windows 95. A couple parts have Vista. There's a little XP thrown in there. It, you never know which system you're working with until you're in it. And the reason we know that this happens is because we were educated. We got the training we need to understand how those experiences affect their brain. And when we know that it affected how they grow and develop and how their stress response developed, then it was really easy for it to not be about us. When it's they're not acting, really easy. <laughs> for us to it's understand. Possible. For us to understand. That doesn't mean it's easy in the moment. In the moment. Okay. But it's easy for us to understand that that's what they know. And those survival strategies, when they were in place, they grew them that way to keep themselves safe. And that's brilliant. Do, do, any, do any of you work with like an occupational therapist and use sort of sensory type um, responses to help kids with the traumas? Can you talk about that piece a little bit, if you do? I, I do frequently. I know you do too. We have, uh, with, with lots, in lots of different ways, and a lot of it has just been self-education because medical assistants often won't cover it. Okay. Uh, and you know, the school occupational therapist has a whole different idea of, you know, well, let's have him wear the lead vest. Well, you know, if he can't move fast, he doesn't feel safe. Mm -hmm. So, it, uh, there, but there are a lot of sensory things that make a huge, huge difference. And, you know, go. Yeah, so um, my kids are extremely hypervigilant. So asking them to sit still for anything is asking too much because they just don't feel safe enough to do that. So we use all different kinds of fidgets with them and gum because having something that they can keep active while they're hypervigilant will allow part of their body to sit still. So they're able to slowly acquire the skills to do the behaviors that we are looking for in a way that feels appropriate to them. Uh, when we have a new child come into our house, for example, we never make their bed. In the closet, in the linen closet, we have different um, textures, materials, colors for sheets and blankets. We also have a variety of animals, we have night lights, we have all sorts of assorted things because anybody who's been doing foster care for a while know that bedtime's probably going to be a challenging time, one way or another, and oftentimes you don't know exactly how it's going to go until they're in their bed. But giving them the opportunity to pick whatever sensory things that help them feel safe next to their body makes bedtime a little bit easier. And then there's no judgment about, you're 12 years old, are you really gonna sleep with a bear anymore? There's no expectation. They can make their bed feel safe 
and comfortable and get their room ready however they want for where they're at. And all we do is help them to put the sheets on that they can pick. So sensory things end up being really important because sometimes it's those sensory reminders. Sometimes it's a smell. Sometimes it's a texture. Sometimes it's a particular thing you're doing with your body that's a trauma reminder in and of itself. A girl who is sexually abused by a man that wears a particular kind of cologne or aftershave, when she smells that cologne or aftershave, what do you think she's gonna remember? Does it matter if it's a different man? Probably not. Her body's gonna smell that and she's gonna think sexual abuse. So you have to be really careful about those different kinds of sensory inputs and give the child as much control as you can over those parts of their environment to help them feel safe. So for me, I don't think of it necessarily in a therapeutic context, I think of it in a control context. Those are lots of little things that I can give my kids control over. The more control they have over their environment and their experience, the safer they'll feel. The safer they'll feel, the higher brain they will be activated. And what I want is to be able to reason with them and use my words. I don't want them stuck in flight, fright, or freeze all day, every day. I have two kids who can uh, wiggle and learn, or they can sit still and be really disruptive. So uh, we had we left them on these little wiggle cushions, uh, you know, that they can put on their chairs and go for. So we have those at school. We also have a set at home. We'll just keep them in the car for when you know we're going to have to be at an appointment a long time, parent-teacher conferences, whatever. Wherever we have to go, there's a cushion. Sometimes they don't even use them, but they carry it along. So or you can use a stress box. Or behind their desk, you can take the chair all the way away, take a square on the floor, and as long as they stay in that square, they can move around as much as they want, but it's fine. You have to figure out what approaches will be effective for your child to give them what they need so they can learn. At home, system. at school. Mm -hmm. We created a safe space for anger in our attic. Our, we have a partially finished attic. and. Um, you know, without the training, we ended up making it a sensory integration zone. We have a mattress in there they can jump on. We have balls. Um, he had an explosive fit up there. And, like, you know, if you take something and you think, well, how much do I like that lamp? You know, and he throws it, what's going to happen? And then he throws it, he's like, oh, light bulb. Okay, so we have to clean that up. That's not good. We won't do that again. Um, but, you know, you make it so that they can have that experience, get that rage out, and learn how to calm themselves down faster and faster. Because anytime they learn the skills to recover from their own temper tantrum themselves without you trying to recover for them, or you bribing them with something to start calming down, the faster they'll be able to calm themselves down. The more environments they'll be able to calm themselves down in, and the more people they'll be able to calm themselves down around. Yep. Um, I've seen a lot more tolerance with um, things like wiggle, wiggle seeds and things like that within um, the elementary schools. And it seems like the older uh, children get, the less tolerance it is for their spikier behaviors. Mm -hmm. Can you speak a little bit to how you're working with the, the high schools and the middle schools to get them to understand more about the trauma importance? NCTSN has a couple of really effective handouts that you can give to educators using Educator Speak to help them understand how trauma derails development. And when you're talking with the teacher and they understand how social development and the ability to sit still or recover from stress stopped at age three, so they're still acting like a three-year-old when they're in states of stress, it's really easy for them to accommodate behaviors in a way that would be socially acceptable in that elementary school. But what we notice is when they don't have that information, the high school teachers get caught up with the shoulds. You're 14, you should know this by now. You should know better, you should be able to control your body. And what they don't understand is the way these kids grew up and how their experiences affected them and affected their development. No, they shouldn't. No, they can't. They have not yet acquired these skills. Not that they can't, but they haven't yet. And if they want to be effective, if they're more concerned with being effective, 
than worrying about being right that they should be able to do something and they want these kids to learn, then they're gonna be motivated to help keep them safe, acquire the skills that they need to catch up. Because once the kids feel safe in the room, they're not hypervigilant, they have what they need, they're able to use the tools that they have and build on them, they'll be able to learn. And most teachers don't go into the profession for the paycheck. They're there because they really wanna help kids learn. So if you can give them tools the teacher's tools to help them understand their students, to help them learn. My experiences, most of them are grateful for the help. They're like, oh, well that makes sense. Oh, so that's why they can't use the girls' bathroom. Oh, that's why lunchtime is hard. Oh, that's why it's hard for them to sit down in this kind of a chair. Well, let's fix that because I would really have, rather have them focus on that. Yep. Um, Speaking of sitting still, I'm wondering if we can take just a quick 10 minute break. Sure. Let everybody use the bathroom and we'll come back at 20 What yep. we were talking about before the break was the effect that trauma has on development and how exposure to trauma affects the brain to develop in a way that causes the child to survive. It's in survival mode. It, it causes the child to be on the alert for danger, to be able to react quickly to threats, and that's when we're thinking about that lower brain, the flight, fright, freeze response. And the stress hormones that are produced by the body during this trauma, while they're in the flight, fight, freeze response with their lower brain, also inhibits development of the higher brain function. So not only are those pathways of higher brain function, logical, rational thinking, not activated, but the hormones inhibit their development. So it's an added challenge that we need to encounter but we can get development back on track. Traumatized children and adolescents can learn new ways of thinking, new ways of relating, new ways to respond to stress. That rational thought and self-awareness can help children to override those primitive brain responses once they're able to understand and feel like they know what's happening within their body in response to something. In many cases, understanding what's triggering that stress Stress response. What's reminding them of that trauma with older kids is enough to understand what's happening in the body so they can use the tools they already have in other contexts to override that stress response. It's hugely empowering for them. And you can unlearn and rebuild those experiences within the brain, those connections, but it takes a lot of time. So trauma-informed parents, what we do is we offer a secure base of love and protection. We try to do whatever we can so that kids can feel secure, that when they're with us, they are loved, and that our number one job is to keep them safe. We try to be emotionally available for them, physically available, to give them that one-on-one -on -one time like we were talking about to help them process and think about things in a new way, in a loving and a safe way. We try, like every parent, to recognize and respond to their needs, but we're trying to help them learn that parents can respond to their needs and respond to them in a way that's healthy, that's not hurtful, that's not abusive, that's not neglectful. So that's a new way of interacting and responding to them for these kids. We can help provide guidance and example. Uh, one of our most powerful tools that we have when they're trying to teach kids to understand their own stress response and what to do when they're elevated is to model it for them. And when you understand how their stress response is deregulated, we can model for them in a way that's really effective for them. And provide all kinds of opportunities to safely explore the world. Give them those new experiences that you would like every child to have, but do it in a way that helps them to feel safe, feel safe, even though we know that they are safe with us. And a really good tip that Colleen and her husband gave us, so you guys facilitated our kids training, <laughs> um, that actually I think every possible parent should know, and it's really simple, but you just don't think of it, especially uh, example is <coughs> show your foster kids that you make mistakes. Guaranteed, 100% of them are coming in with, I'm a bad kid, I make mistakes, I'm screw up. And they think that there's no way 
you know, they screw up and that's just it. You know, who, maybe they were beaten for it, maybe, you know, the neglect came from that. At least, if nothing else, that's their perception. And uh, so at the dinner table, my wife and I, when we, you know, we don't do it every night, but every once in a while, we go, oh, you know, I was at work today and I screwed up. Man, I dropped the ball on this thing and my boss came down on me and I kind of got yelled at and, and my wife, well, what'd you do? And I go, well, you know, I said, sorry, I apologize. I kind of dusted myself off. I fixed it and I went on it and it was no big deal. And, you know, I, I kind of stunk. It kind of ruined my day, but hey, I'm home. It's over and done with. It's in the past. And you should see the look on our foster daughter's face when we talk about when we screw up. It's not, it's, it's just this, oh my goodness, everybody screws up, not just me. And she gets so excited. And then she'll say, well, you know, we had an example. It was about a month ago where I can't remember, something happened at school. She took somebody's toy that they were playing with and she didn't realize it. And we said, well, what did you do? I said, well, I apologized and I gave it back and then I found another toy. And, and I was happy playing with that toy. And it was like, <laughs> and there you go, you know, and it's not going to happen every time, but really showing foster kids that you're imperfect as well is really going to help them understand that everybody's imperfect because they, they think they're the only ones who screw up and it, lots of examples can really help them realize that everybody makes <coughs> mistakes and everybody can re recover from mistakes. So just because you make a mistake doesn't mean you're a bad person, it just means you made a mistake. In a way that my husband and I work really hard to model that for kids that's also a very scary thing for them is we disagree with each other in front of them. And that's really scary for a lot of these kids because their caregivers disagreeing was often what instigated bad things that happen next, especially physical violence. Lots of arguments start and then hitting starts, so there's domestic violence and then perhaps hitting them as well. But watching us disagree about something, interact and model positively how you can not like something somebody else did, you can have a different opinion of something somebody else did, and actively making sure that we are disagreeing publicly every single day, making up, verbalizing the whole thing with our thought process because you know this wasn't modeled for these kids growing up was huge for our kids. So I'll say things to my husband like, I really didn't like it when you left your shoes in the kitchen. That bothered me and I tripped over them and I was worried I was going to get hurt. And I do not normally talk to my husband like that. But I needed to model this for my kids so they can understand it. And then my husband will be like, well, I was just in a hurry to go to the bathroom. I wasn't trying to hurt you with leaving my shoes in the kitchen. I say, well, it still made me feel really scared and I was worried. And then my husband will say, oh, I'm so sorry. I wasn't trying to make you feel scared and I love you and I want to help keep you safe. And I'll be like, well, I'm so glad you love me and keep me safe. But my body still feels a little bit scared and it's kind of even worried. You don't love me anymore and you were trying to hurt me on purpose. And then he'll come over and give me a hug and be like, I'm trying to show you right now with my hug. And he will say this in front of the kids. I'm showing you that I love you with my hug. I'm showing you I'm going to keep you safe and I will always be here to keep you safe. And this conversation is not for the benefit of my husband. <laughs> so leave it or not, it's for the kids. And when this was a suggestion that we got from a trauma-informed therapist as one of the things that we could do in our daily life to help heal our kids and get them to respond differently. And what we found when we started doing this and modeling these kind of interactions and verbalizing the things that my husband and I take for granted was that they were starting to look at the world a little bit different. So now when they go to school and they see people starting to argue, instead of getting elevated with their stress response, they wait. They watch and see. Is it going to be like it was in my family where it's going to come to blows? Or is it going to be like at my home now where they're going to work it out and give each other a hug and it won't be a big deal? And my kids learned to pause. My and believe me, I never would have done that before. <laughs> <laughs> my example isn't that powerful, but what I talk about a lot at the dinner table is um, the voice in my head that tells me I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, and I can't do anything right. Some days that voice is really loud, but and some days it's pretty quiet, but I talk about it on the days that it's loud so that they know that 
everybody has those thoughts. And it, it, just because your brain thinks it doesn't mean it's true. You know, and then my husband might say, well, this is how I see you, and, and I don't think that voice in your head is, means that. But then the kids will jump in, too, and say how they see me. So it kind of, you know, just shining some light on some painful things can really be helpful to them. And my illustration is much tidier than that. <laughs> we have a swear jar, and essentially it's me. <laughs> I fund it, I buy the pizza, <laughs> and they really enjoy catching me doing something wrong, and they always say, I know you were frustrated. Or it gives them a chance to accept somebody else's mood or whatever, and, and forgive. In a way that benefits them. Yes! <laughs> That was one of his 
He said that you know 20 or 30 times a day. I should just kill myself. And whatever. So I just said life is good. And I'm a bad kid. I mean, he truly believed he was a bad kid. And in fact, I said to him once, "Well, why are you in foster care?" And he said, "I'm a bad kid. In fact, I might even be evil." So uh, we flipped it to. I'm kind, I'm funny, and I'm learning to be a friend. So just to give him a little more positive mindset right out of the box, and, and you don't have to make it you know, something that the kid can hang on to. A lot of it is just being aware that it's there. And this is how kids feel about themselves. If no grown up, uh, I can remember sitting in a, in a meeting and uh, a social worker saying, well, you need to tell them that the grown ups will make those decisions. It's not for them to worry about. I thought, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. <laughs> no one's ever told this kid the truth, and you know, their parents' decisions have been pretty flawed. So grown-ups lie. And you know, helping them see that some grown-ups make poor choices, some grown-ups do the best job they can, and other grown-ups are going to do this for you. So it, it, it just helps them kind of start looking a little differently. And then when you combine it with the cognitive triangle, but looking, you'll, you're doing that next, right? No. <laughs> so, oh, so some other examples of things for the invisible suitcase, like my daughter, for instance, believes, what she believes about caregivers is that elevated. So I'll get on the bus to go someplace. Her mom will get off. She'll be left on the bus. That's her belief. How it shows in her behavior when she believes that is that she cannot be separated from me for any length of time and feel safe. So when I understand, and I use this idea of the invisible suitcase to understand that she's not being clingy and annoying, but she's so afraid of being abandoned that she'll do anything to make sure that she's not, then I can respond to her acting that way differently. How we use it. My son, on the other hand, has come to the realization that we're pretty safe, but the world, the world is a scary place. Maybe there's just a couple of people that will be safe, but the world is scary. So if we're in our home and we touch each other, no big deal. He goes to school and another child or a teacher rushes up against his foot as they're walking across the room we are talking major temper tantrum because that's scary. That is a threat. The world is a scary, dangerous place, and if anybody touches me, I know they're going to hurt me because that's the way the world works. And until you understand what they believe and what they think is real, their perceptions about themselves or the caregivers or the world are, and you have some idea what they are, you can't do anything to help them heal. So this was a really powerful way for me as a foster parent to organize how I can do things to keep them to feel safe because I know what they think. And as they say things, I've never done anything as creative as like putting it in a suitcase so that they can really take ownership <coughs> over something like this. And I think it's just brilliant. So I'll be still now. Okay, well, <laughs> but I organize it myself. And when they say things that give me a clue about what they think about themselves, then I can think about things, stuff that we can do, stuff that we can help to reinforce to repack the suitcase, and they can view themselves differently. I can think about things that I can do deliberately as a caregiver to help them repack that suitcase so they can believe I will take care of them differently. I can think about ways I can structure their worlds and their interactions with other people so that they can feel safe and think and believe different things about the world. But I can't do any of that if I don't understand what they believe. And this tool was a powerful way for me to help organize that intuitive sense that I understood that they feel like something's wrong or something's wrong with them, but it gave me something I could do with that information. So when we protect kids, from harm, we help them learn that the world is safe. When we support, nurture, and respond to them, children learn that they're capable. And when we give them affection and love, they learn that they're lovable. All of these things are ways that we can help them repack their suitcase. 
and it gives us a tool to talk to each other about how to be effective. Because as foster parents, if there's something that we have learned from going through these trauma-informed parenting classes, is that we're all way more interested in cutting to the chase and being effective than worrying about whether or not what we're already doing, what worked for somebody else, for other kids, for them when they were younger, worrying about whether or not it's right. We'd just rather be effective.
So I went to run some errands and um, my husband called me and, and we have furniture throwing again in our home. We have explosive screaming, we have um, attacking going on. Um, so I came home and, and we're trying to deal with it. We snuggled up together. We read wherever you are, that one about surround, my love surrounds you wherever you are. Um, and so we, we did some joint reading of that and he would point to who he wanted to read what. And, do some stuff. <coughs> and that helps him in the moment. Um, but that week he got kicked out of his class a couple times. He just couldn't handle, he, he can't find a safe space anymore. He's not safe, I just threatened him. I just told him there's a possibility in this world that I'm not gonna come home. And even though I'm not going to do that, I can't convince him of that in this moment. We just have to start where he is right now and um, keep reassuring, keep doing the little, to go back to six months or a year ago, do all those little steps there to build that foundation up again. So then I get to talk at dinner about how I screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> And how that hurts people sometimes, and, and then we apologize and we do fix it. Resident expert. <laughs> <laughs> Children who've been through trauma might have really valid fears about their own safety or the safety of their loved ones. They might have really valid fears of abandonment. They might have difficulty trusting adults to protect them. Be hyper aware of potential threats. Have problems controlling their reactions to perceived threats. Or in our experience, all of the above. And all of the above on a very regular basis. So as foster parents, we need tools that we can use to be effective with our kids. Because this is overwhelming in and of itself. And so sad that these wonderful children are growing up in a place where this is what they believe. It's our job to be their emotional container. Is that a concept anybody's familiar with? It's our job, no matter what they're feeling, no matter how they're expressing that feeling, appropriate or not, to be there for them and show them that we can In order for them to heal, they have to grow beyond having the feelings to expressing the feelings. They have to grow beyond expressing the feelings to expressing the feelings safely. They have to grow beyond being safe expressing those feelings to expressing them in an appropriate time and context. That is a lot of steps. Would you expect a two-year-old to be able to handle their frustration with anybody in any environment? No. That's not a reasonable expectation. So when they're acting out and throwing a fit on the floor of a grocery store, you don't take it personally. You absorb all of those overwhelmed, frustrating, angry feelings that they're having. You handle the behaviors at the time you help comfort them and love them and help them feel safe and show that you can handle it. Our challenge is that we'll have a 12 year old do the exact same thing, except now they're stronger, they're bigger, they know how to have fits that carry on quite a bit longer because even with a short attention span for a 12 year old, that's still a lot longer than a two year old, but they're acting the same way because they haven't grown and developed beyond that. And it's our job to show them that we will love them and support them and take care of them and we can handle all of that. Whatever feelings they're having, however they're showing those feelings, period. And we are there to contain it. And oftentimes it's our job to be the first person in the world that shows them that we'll love them no matter how they feel, that they can feel anything they want with us and we will still love them and they'll still be safe, and we can still move on with our day and teach them how to express those feelings and be able to move on. And that is a daunting task, even if you are a 
because a 12 year old temper tantrum is just hard. Not that a two year old temper tantrum can't be hard, especially if it's the seventh one in the day. But if you have a 12 year old throwing seven temper tantrums in a day and one of them's four hours long, that's exhausting to be their container. But if you're not, you're just another person in the world reinforcing those beliefs about themselves, about caregivers, and about the world that they're coming with in their invisible suitcase that says, I am inherently not lovable, you can't handle me, nobody can, something is wrong with me. Or you can handle the behaviors, you can handle the feelings, you can <coughs> love them anyway, and you can help them to learn and grow. That's our choice. So for us, we have to be prepared to tolerate strong emotional reactions. We have to put it into a context where especially after the, after the fact, when we're calm and not quite so overwhelmed and in the middle of crisis mode, that we can handle it. And it is your job as social workers to support us when we're doing this, because it's going to be hard. And we need you to remind us of tools that we have that we know about when we are too tired to remember them all ourselves. And that's why it's so important when foster parents call you in crisis that you are well educated in things that are effective for parenting these children on an individual basis for what that child needs. So you can have an effective conversation with that foster parent rather than being just an additional level of bureaucracy and stress. Because all of you are here and all of you are doing this job to help. And so are we. There are a lot of emotional hotspots that kids have that are just challenges. Oftentimes, because the homes that they're coming from never place much emphasis on routine and predictability, and this is a lot of the time the way neglect, even benign neglect, comes into play when we're thinking about kids who've been maltreated. Food and meal times, hot button issues. Typically problematic. Either kids that don't know where their next meal are coming from, kids that are so hypervigilant and high energy that they need to eat every hour or two, or you can expect a temper tantrum. Kids that have been extremely malnourished, so they have special dietary needs. Or kids that are so not used to trying new foods because when they get to eat, all they have is just crap. That you're gonna try to introduce the idea of fruit or vegetables or something to help their body grow and develop and they'll have no idea where it's coming from and not understand what you're trying to do to be helpful. Sleep and bedtime are a huge hot button issue. In addition to the fact that these kids are often coming from a place where there was no routine surrounding what's happening, sleep and bedtime is not a predictable recurring <coughs> thing. They just can do whatever they want. But also because once they go to sleep, those dreams, that's where it comes back. So they're re-experiencing those hard things that they remember and however they perceive those events, that's where it's gonna come back out. I've never met a foster child who didn't have nightmares. And it's very common for me to get up with my kids three, four times a night. And these are kids that have been with me for years. Although at the beginning, it was seven or eight times a night with nightmares, so this is much better but it's still an hour and a half to two hour long process to get them to bed so that they can feel safe and try to go to sleep. And then there are physical boundary issues, safety concerns about how close is too close to touch, what kind of touch is safe and what kind of touch is icky and what kind of touch hurts, privacy concerns for kids who maybe never had privacy or are so guarded because they're so worried about being hurt that they need absolute privacy and they're terrified of what happens if somebody's in the next room while they're going to the bathroom. Personal grooming issues, there's a lot of abuse that happens like Ron was talking about that's related to grooming like the soap and the eyes. Um, 
And there's the neglect issue that comes in with kids who've never taken a shower, never brushed their teeth, never brushed their hair, don't get to wear clean clothes, don't understand what any of these things are. So you have to take them way back regardless of their age and teach them all of these things, even when it's kind of inappropriate for you to try to teach a 10 year old how to wipe themselves when they're done going to the bathroom because they have no idea. And you have to be extremely creative in how you could do that one in particular in an appropriate way. But there's all kinds of challenges that come up with personal grooming. And then medical care. Kids who haven't had medical care or only had emergency room care, going to the doctor or a clinic or a hospital can be a trauma reminder. It can remind them of the time they had to go there with a broken arm. It can remind them of the time when the mandated reported reporter that was the doctor called social services because their whole body head to toe was covered in bruises and cigarette burns and whatever it was and they went to the doctor with mom and dad but they didn't get to go home with mom and dad there's all kinds of complications for that these are huge hot spots that are very predictable as far as we're concerned when we have a child come in to our home as somebody that we're not familiar with these are the areas where we expect some kind of issues to come up. We don't necessarily know what, but we feel really good if we have some kind of an idea because you as social workers are able to tell us this is probably gonna be a problem for them, this is gonna be hard for them, this is something that is probably gonna be a trauma reminder for them. These are the things that are expected. Then there's the things that are more individual based on the specific traumatic experiences that these kids have had. People, <laughs> situations, places, things, feelings that remind children of traumatic events. And we've already talked about these quite a lot. This is the idea that we were talking about with the snake and the stick when you're walking across the path. These are things that remind you, like the stick could remind you of a snake. This could be the cologne that some random person wears that reminds you because you smell like the person who sexually assaulted them. Um, I think we all have tons of examples. The idea for trauma reminders is that you don't know what kinds of things are gonna remind them of their trauma. It could be wearing a baseball glass cap, it could be a cologne that you wear, it could be a particular time of day, it could be a cafeteria, it could be anything. And oftentimes they're not what we would expect because our understanding of the situation that was hard for the children is gonna be different than the child's perception of that situation. And whatever sensory input they were getting, seeing, feeling, um, smelling, hearing, etc., that's what's gonna remind them. And they often mean? don't know why their body is responding that way. They just are having a physiological response and responding. They can't put it together that it's a or for, for our kids, it's August. Um, they were taken out of their home and uh, had three moves in August. And so all of August is just really awful at our house. Into September, most of September is pretty bad too. Um, by November, we're recovering and then preparing for the trauma of Christmas. Um, but like those types of things, they, they can't put a name on that. They just have to bump it down. And then they oftentimes feel like something is wrong with them because their body is having that physiological response, that adrenaline is going through them, they're feeling scared, whereas before they were feeling just fine and they don't understand why now, all of a sudden when everything was fine five minutes ago, they're feeling terrified. And they think something is wrong with them. And then it reinforces those beliefs in the invisible suitcase that something is wrong with them. They are the reason why this abuse happened to them. And it's a self-perpetuating cycle until you can figure out a way to help them heal and integrate those experiences. And as foster parents, there's a million things that we can do every day to help with that. And oftentimes, even the most educated foster parents still need the support of a large number of people on their team in terms of mental health professionals and social workers and teachers and everybody to help us work together to do something about this. We live in a, a very small town with a really enthusiastic volunteer fire department. And everything goes out every time there's a call. And they love to use the sirens. So kids in our house get used to sirens, usually pretty quickly. Uh, but we had a child who just could not. I mean, it, it was just more terror than he could handle. And after a few months, 
he told us about uh, being in the ambulance while his mom was giving birth to one of his siblings and her screaming that she was going to die. And it's like, whoever is conscious that a kid would be in an ambulance with someone giving birth? I mean, that's that not going to turn up in any of the paperwork. Yeah, and that a siren, as it was, the siren was on in the ambulance as they were driving to the hospital is what reminds me of that. You know, but being able to verbalize that, like, I bet that if I were in that situation, I would be terrified too, and I'd be having this reaction. And then you can normalize it for them because they're not crazy. Frequent reactions to trauma minors help keep a child in that elevated state. They're emotionally upset because they don't understand why they're upset in the first place. They're supposed to feel safe here. They don't know that it's the sirens that are going by outside random times of day that are what's making them feel upset. So they're constantly stressed. They're hypervigilant. Their stress response system is elevated. And then they're seen by other people as overreacting to something that's nothing. Because the siren's not affecting everybody else in the house. Something is wrong with just that child. He just wants attention. Yeah. We should punish him for acting out because nothing happened and he's acting out over nothing, right? Well, to them it's not nothing. Exactly. Yeah. That's the point. And it's also, I think Shannon's mentioned this before, this isn't this isn't a free pass for. I, I part of especially with the challenge with us is our foster daughter, Shannon mentioned it all before, no real no, nothing, no routine. She had no idea that of consequences. I mean, if she did, she had no idea of consequences, period. If she didn't eat, if she didn't like what was eat, she didn't realize that she'd be hungry 15 minutes later. You know, I'm still hungry. Well, we just had, well, I didn't, you know, she, did, she couldn't put that together. It's, she's doing much better now, but it's, it's really, they have a really difficult time, but it's still not a free pass. I mean, it, I think there's free passes in some case, you know, the siren, but you know, if they're throwing stuff and everything, they're still, you still have to show them that there's consequences to that behavior and that behavior is unacceptable. It's okay to be scared of the sirens or to be scared and upset at what's happening, but how they deal with it has to be different. And when they are aware of what their own trauma reminders are, when you become aware that it's a siren that's making your body feel this way and it makes sense, then somebody can remind you, you're okay. That's the siren going by. The siren will pass. When the siren passes, it'll be easier for your body to calm down and you can help them work through it so then you're not getting all the acting out behaviors. And that's, that's kind of our job for what we do is we help the child learn to develop the skills to handle it themselves. So then when something else comes up unexpectedly and they're having a reaction to something that shouldn't be anything, and from somebody else's perspective, they're completely overreacting to an ordinary event, they'll start to acquire tools that they can use to <coughs> self-regulate. So even if it's something different and even if they don't understand their own trauma reminders because they're young or they just don't have the experience yet to do that, they'll still learn life skills. And this is a way that we can use to help them understand. It's a tool that we have to help us react to that situation, for us to go immediate into, it doesn't matter why the child's upset. We know that our job right now is to help them feel safe because until they feel safe, they're not gonna calm down and we will handle the rest when they're calm. And maybe we'll even find out why they were upset in the first place. Yep, got about five minutes. Yeah, we're not going to get through half this presentation. <laughs> when you cry in our health, and then cry in our hip, and then cry in our left in the closet, your brain develops differently. And cause and effect are not really that well linked for you. So you might tell them, we don't throw balls in our house, or whatever the rule is. But just because every single time you've said it, that's true, doesn't mean that they really made that connection yet. It might take a moment for them to make those connections. The whole idea, to just summarize what we're trying to talk about here, can be um, using the iceberg analogy. What's <coughs> happening with the child that you see is the tip of the iceberg. Those are the behaviors that they're exhibiting. 
but it's everything else underneath the iceberg, what's underneath the water that you can't see that's informing the behaviors. So if you want to change the behavior, you want to help these kids that you are already aware, even if you don't know how their experience of trauma was integrated to them, even if you don't know what their reminders are, even if you don't know everything that's packed into their invisible suitcase, if you take nothing else away, if you can understand that the behaviors that they're showing you are connected to the big picture that they're not, and it's when you figure out the big picture and you help them to integrate it that you get healing, that's how you learn to be effective. Does anybody else have any questions as we wrap it up for today? Yep. So you mentioned that it's so important to get consequences. I'm assuming you find it difficult to get a consequence that doesn't give that memory, memory thought. So how do you, you know, um, I mean, get it's just, it's kind of a, uh, I, we haven't yet got a single point. I had time out, could go some memories in, and we don't we do kind of time in. Well, if we, they'll go to their room for a few minutes, and then we come and we sit and we talk about behavior, and, and it's, it's a much, as opposed to go to your room, and then we'll see you later. So, now you can come out. But yeah, I mean, you kind of have to feel it out. A time out for a kid could mean they got sent to their room, and then mom or dad came in and even sent to us later. Um, and so you kind of have to. Or your feelings of abandonment. Or right. Yeah, I'm alone. Mom locked me in a room when I was and left, and I was left. I didn't get back. And so you do have to you do have to feel it out, but it still has to it still has to be there. There has to be something. And like the Shannon said too, in the in the moment when they're in this ultra heightened, you know, flight, fight, or freeze, that's not the time for consequences because they're just not going to get it. You know, you, you de escalate. And they're not going to differentiate between consequences. And punishment for these kids is often not something you would ever do. But that's their expectation. So in our house, we there are consequences for behaviors, but we try to structure things in a way that everything comes back to safety. So if you break a safety rule in our house, you're going to need to fix it. You're going to need to do relationship repair. You're going to need to give that person time back. The consequence that we have is them figuring out how to make it okay for the person that they hurt. Everything else is just a function of routine. So it's not a consequence for you not finishing your homework. It's just that you can't do the next thing until your homework is done. So you can make that take as long or as short as you want. And if you choose not to do your homework at school, I don't get to choose that for you. But this next thing, this play activity they want to do, whatever is coming next, doesn't come next until it's done. So it's not me putting things on them. It's about connections and relationship. It's about fixing things. It's about understanding what comes first and next. And that's what we focus on, not trying to come up with what's an appropriate logical consequence for this. Because a lot of natural consequences most parents use are completely ineffective with foster kids. If you've got a child who is starved and malnourished and they forget their lunch at home, and you think, oh, natural consequence, they didn't bring their lunch to school, so I'm not gonna bring it to them. Do you really think that that's gonna be what they learn? Or are they going to learn that you're yet another adult who doesn't care whether or not they eat and they don't feel safe about food now? There's a lot of things that are just different because of that sense of safety. So you have to be creative in how you structure things so they don't perceive what you're doing as being punitive and that you can feel like they are learning the skills they need to be able to function effectively. And for us, our experience is that that doesn't come down to figuring out a consequence for a misbehavior. It's more about teaching. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Oh, go ahead. Then, final note, your foster parents will screw up. <laughs> oh, yeah. And let them know that that's okay, because there's going to be times when they're not going to realize that they're going to think they're doing something right, and all of a sudden the kid goes off the deep end, and they're going to feel horrible, because they told the kid to sit down in the car seat, and whatever, that triggers something. It's, it's happened, and it's okay. I mean, it's, it's just going to happen with this type of stuff. And you're going to, and that, but it'll help, so it'll open the door, and then they can figure out, they might find a piece of, okay, something happened at some point in time. Thank you for